Well, this morning is very exciting for me because I get to talk to someone who has a British accent, but he is originally from UK. His, uh, he has been living in North Carolina for quite some time. Yeah, we've actually lived in a few different spots, but now we're back in North Carolina again. So yeah, all over. So his expertise is in teaching personal safety. He's a body language leader, speaker, author. I love this title. Dads will love it. Not with my daughter, all in caps. A dad's guide to screening dates and boyfriends. He has two girls, 19 and 17, a boy who's 15, former British Royal Marine Commando, elite branch of Her Majesty's Royal Navy, body language workshops to Fortune 500 companies, realtors, and I love how we mentioned um, earlier situational awareness and how to protect ourselves, especially in this crazy, don't you think? I don't think we've oh. ever lived in such an insane, unpredictable, um, what would you call it? I mean, the environment, I, now after seeing the news and being Asian, even though we live in Hawaii, it just, it mm -hmm. becomes um, this fear. So have you come across, I would love to hear what can the average person who is not, you know, my daughter took martial arts, but as we know, that doesn't mean anything. Um, and you know, I'm like under five feet. Um, what do we do? What is, what is your, well, let me start at the beginning. If, if you are able to put in the training needed to become proficient in a variety of different skills, be it martial arts, tactical firearms, edged weapons, whatever it may be. Cause I taught that for a whole bunch of years after getting out of the military. That's great. You should have those skills if you can put in the time to acquire them. But most people are not going to put in the kind of time necessary to become really proficient in order to, to, to safely say I could defend myself in a life-threatening situation using these skills. That's a very small percentage of people that can confidently say that. The reality is fighting's messy. Everybody gets hurt. How, how hurt, you know, depends on the circumstances, the person you're fighting or the group of people you might be fighting. So I, I do believe you should have those skills. I think you should have those in your toolbox ready to go but none of them necessarily are going to help you a great deal if you're not already aware of what's going on around you. Because if you can't get your self-defense tool in the fight, if you've tuned out at the exact moment someone decides to punch you and grab your purse or drag you into an alley, by the time you're sort of cognizant enough to go, okay, now's the time for my skill set, it could be over. So we can't lean on those skills and say, okay, I don't need anything else. We still have to be aware. And one thing that I've been critical of over the years is the simplicity of being told by, you know, so-called other experts, be situationally aware. That's great. I, I mean, that, I applaud that. You should be aware of what's going on around you, but aware of what? Mm -hmm. If you're specifically looking for things at, at the exact right moment, if you're trying to take in the totality of your environment every moment of every day, you're going to be exhausted in minutes. And you won't do it. You'll stop doing it because it's too bloody tiring. So the, the magic, the key happens when we selectively choose, okay, I'm going to be more attentive now and a little bit less attentive here and on and off. I liken it to an old style thermostat that you turn up and down on the wall with the beveled edges. You can, you dial your attention up and pay attention to specific things at specific times. And then when that moment has passed, when we're at home again, for instance, we dial it back down. Now, you can go down fairly low on this thermostat, but it's never off. You always have a certain amount of attentiveness to your environment at specific times looking for specific things. And if you know what those are, it tends to be manageable. And manageable can be a habit we build that we apply every day. And we don't get safe suddenly by doing one thing once. We do lots of little things consistently as a new habit and that adds up to provide us with concentric rings of protection so one of the things that i always taught while i was teaching the combatives was what are those things you should be looking for and that went from everything from the body language of predatory behavior someone that be thinking maybe thinking about doing something bad all the way through to the environment what do you look for specifically within your, within your environment to know and if you know specifically what to look for then you're going to be a whole lot safer and you have those other skills ready to go if you need it. So what do you think um, if you have 
kids, right? You do. I'm sure you've taught your kids, right? What is yep. a, some simple skills that parents can teach our kids so that it gives them just a little edge just to prepare? <laughs> well, one of the things with children is they adapt very quickly. They learn very quickly, but they tend to model what we do. So it's definitely a case of show them what you want them to do. Don't just tell them. If they see you doing it, they're, they're likely to emulate what you're doing. It's that one time you use a curse word and you say, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> I don't want you to repeat that word. It's Guaranteed repeated. that's the word they remember, right? <laughs> right. So if we, one of the things is this, since my kids were old enough to understand the concept, I would quiz them where places that we would go. We would play what I call the what if game. What if this happened here? And what if this happened there? What would you do? And then we would talk through their responses. Now, of course, this is all done age appropriately. And it wasn't always delivered necessarily geared towards just a threat because I wasn't trying to promote paranoia. Mm -hmm. The, the long-term goal was attentiveness to the environment. So I would test them when they were younger. Okay, as we walk into a building, how many doors did you see on the way in? What was the color of the roof? How many cars did we walk past on the way in? Was there anyone sitting in the car? You know, so we, all these things became a game. And then as they got a little older, they would start to quiz me back. They'd be like, did you see that? Did you see this? And so we turned any excursion, even a simple thing to go to the grocery store, into a way of getting them tuned into their environment and staying present. And one of the best lessons you can give your kids when they're outside of the home is to be anchored in that moment, present to what's going on around them and not allow themselves to be any more distracted than they're likely to be at different points in their life. We're trying to minimize the distractions. And so playing games like that with them at various ages gets them used to being attentive. And one of the things that I realized after doing this for a little while, they love to try and catch you out. And the challenge of that <laughs> is enough. Observant. Yes. They'll hit you with questions. And the byproduct of this whole thing is they are looking out and, and observant because as the parent, we can see only so much. The more eyes we have within our group or our family unit looking, the greater the likelihood we see something that perhaps isn't good. And somebody can raise the alarm because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who it is within the group that says, this isn't right. Did you see that? doesn't matter where it comes from as long as we all respond the same way to it. So one thing is test them. Play the what if game wherever you go. Don't always make it about necessarily about attacks or bad things happening. Just make it attentive to the environment and watch how quickly they adapt. And my kids did brilliantly. They really did. One of the things we used to do, we go to restaurants. We, we order, order our meal or whatever. And then after the waiter leaves and say, okay, give me a description of the waiter. I want to know approximate height, weight, tattoos, distinguishing marks, color of his hair, eyes. Because sometimes I don't even notice the name and they'll be like, mom, did you notice his name is? And I, that's the one thing, oh my gosh, I would fail. I wouldn't, I remember one time I complimented someone on their painting and they mm -hmm. said, it, was my, it was my former in-law and they said, that's been there for 30 years. And I thought I was in the relationship for 10 years. I had never seen it. And that's the joke in our family. It's like, well, this way, mom, the library is this way. And I, I think it's a geographical impairment. I mean, out of all the intelligences. Uh -huh. <laughs> when it, so when you mention, look at the doors and all that, I think um, it's, it's a, and as a mom, I don't know if it's, we always have our list in mind or what we're going to do and yes. what's yes. going to happen. And so we don't even know, like, sometimes I think, wait a minute, did I grab my purchases? Did I, you know, cause mm -hmm. you're in, I guess you're right. You're not in the moment. You yes. are in the next moment. You're in the next one. Yeah. And I find, because my wife does the same thing. She's got a hundred tabs on her computer screen and her <laughs> head open at the same yes, time. Yes, yes. And I don't know how she does it because she'll flip between all these tabs and keep track of everything except the one thing that needs to be really attuned to. And that's what's going on right now in this moment. That's my job but it's also the kid's job. And when she's by herself, she, she does really well by herself. But when I'm there, she's like, whatever. I don't care. But that's what I do. If I'm with uh -huh. someone, I'm not going to remember where my car is because you're there. <laughs> well, unless well, it's a split moment. 
But yes. yeah, because it's something like, hey, if I don't have to worry about it, one less thing, and I'll and I'll put my focus on what am I going to do for dinner? Who? You yes. know, what do I need to tutor the next kid? Oh my gosh, tomorrow. Okay, we have to do this and this, and then I leave, and then my my daughters who are really observant, I see so where do we park? And when they don't know, I'm like, wait a minute, don't you I'm remember, confused. mom? I'm like, no, that that's your mm-hmm. job. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll give them little clues. Okay, you know, when you're there, yeah. look at the thing, it's number 15, do this. But then when you're on your own, and if you're in a hotel in Waikiki, and there's 15 mm-hmm. floors, yeah, that split second, right? I called my husband, he goes, what do you want me to do? I'm in the largest mall in the in the nation and largest outdoor mall. And I said, I know it was in front of the Macy's door. Which floor were you on? <laughs> <laughs> What do you okay so think of it this way when it comes to the power of processing and multitasking it's a it's really a myth that we're any good at it we're really not uh prefrontal cortex the part of the brain that makes you you and it's not of course it's not like a computer but let's just use that reference just for visualization your prefrontal cortex the part of the brain that makes you you that can handle about 42 bits of data per second so every time you split your attention between, you know, the 42, you half it, then you half it again and you half it again. And 42 bits of data sounds like a fair good amount of information. But the reality is your subconscious, kind of the steamship below the, you know, the captain's chair, so to speak, that can handle around 11 million bits of data per second. So we need to move as much of the information as we need to scan for to our subconscious as soon as we can. That way the supercomputer can be scanning. But between locations, when we're going from the car to a building, we go from one building to the next building or even the next store to the next door, we need to tune right back in again. We didn't tune out in the store. We didn't tune out in our car, but we dialed it down. That's where we had the doors locked. We were moving it. We'd be a hard target. The moment we stop, we slow down, we dial it up. Those are the times when we need to be supremely present in that moment and our one task, our 42 bits of data, and then our 11 million bits are all focused on one task, point A, point B safely. Like if I was, just say for instance, if I was younger and you hired me as a close protection officer, you know, a fancy word for a bodyguard, my job would be to get you from all of these various locations safely. And what would be my primary focus? getting you from those locations safely, that would be it. There would be an advanced team. There would be somebody else perhaps helping me. But my focus is in the moment, what's happening right now. And the only projections I would be making is, okay, how far to this door? How far to cover? How far to concealment? How far do I need to go to get you to this location safely if X, Y, and Z happens? That's it. So really what you're doing when you prioritize being attentive and in the moment is being safe between these two spots. That's it. And so do you recommend, sorry. Focus. No, go ahead. Do you recommend not being on your phone? Yes. I know. Well, you know what happens, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if I if I tutor and I don't know if someone's gonna cancel, if they're gonna reschedule, I'm in the middle of picking up something. And of course, I think we all do this. We, don't, we wanna look to see if it's important. And then um, you realize, oh, wait a minute, I forgot to text this person. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, I wonder, you know, what's happening, what the weather is going to be like. Mm -hmm. And then before you know it, um, then someone calls you or someone says, hey, you didn't respond. And I don't know why I can't say I'll respond when I get home or not even respond, you know, but um, kids with video games or I don't know you see these little kids right they're in the car and the, and the parents give them the little device and they're they're three uh-huh. or they're two and they're playing yeah they're building that addiction right what do you say to the average person and it is an addiction I was telling my my um, family it's, mm-hmm. it's either the tv or um, I don't know any electronic device Well, they build those programs and the apps within the phones and the games themselves to give us little shots of dopamine. And that's part of the reason why they're so addictive. But we can we can sort of use that to our advantage in some ways. One way would be on your phone, change your screensaver to something different and something about personal safety and being alert once a week or twice a week, because we open our phone on average 80, 90 a hundred times plus a day. So every time, you know, there should be a different image, a different graphic, something that reminds us if I am not 
static somewhere with my phone up, scanning my periphery while I check the phone, I'm doing something wrong. And there are a million different personal safety messages you can put on your phone so at least you're reminded every time you go to the device. The other thing is when we enter or we're moving between environments or we enter a new building, put your phone away and have a look around at the people that are around you and look for people that perhaps are paying you too much attention. Someone that doesn't fit in that environment. And when you see someone that fits those particular markers, you give yourself a figurative pat on the back. You're like, nice job, well done, that was good. This verbal programming, or even though if obviously if you're outdoors, you're gonna do it inside your own head, is a ways and means to give your own brain a pat on the back for seeing it. And that will release a little of that dopamine. It's not gonna exactly right out of the gate compete with the distraction of the phone, but it does help. And your brain starts to go, okay, well, this is something that we should be doing more often. And you keep adding in things to look for systematically over a period of your days or weeks or months, and you reward yourself when you see it. The thing is with body languages, there are a lot of strange people out there. And some of the predatory signals that you might look for, like reduced head movement and shifty eyes, for instance, you'll see that in Walmart on a Saturday afternoon. It doesn't mean something nefarious is going to happen, but it doesn't mean that it's not. And so there's this, it, this com comparison of, okay, does this person mean me harm? Because they've shown me these signals. They might, but up until the moment where they perpetrate the crime, they can change their mind. Mm -hmm. So we might see these signals and nothing bad happens. And sometimes we're going to see those signals and they were thinking about it. And then they changed their mind because we were attentive enough to put them off. Like the guy coming up and patting you on the shoulder. You should have seen him coming 20 yards away. You should have known it was coming. Yeah, that in, um, I was in LA and someone just tapped me on the back and I was just, yeah, I did the flight. I did everything. I screamed, I froze. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And then the worst part of it is I didn't remember that I screamed and I, I didn't even remember anything. Mm -hmm. So what would I, okay, so I have another scenario. Um, I was mm -hmm. robbed in Paris. Um, I was um, with my daughter on a spring break high school trip. And I did, mm -hmm. I was looking around. I did my, you know, my, my bag was inside my jacket. I had everything that I thought I was aware. And then I saw these lavender sachets. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so I reached over and I guess my whole focus was on that sachet in that brief moment, I mm -hmm. guess um, they opened my bag, they took my wallet and I didn't even know, Terry, I did not even know that happened until oh. I went to this um, hot chocolate shop with a, with a tour guide. And I was like, I reached over and I was, oh my gosh, my, um, my whole wallet, it was a wallet that I borrowed from my, my 11 year old. It was a Hello Kitty wallet that she got on her for her birthday. And I said, I promise to not get it dirty. Yeah. I promise to take care of it. The whole wallet mm -hmm. with my euros, my my cards, everything was gone. And I felt like, wait a minute, I mm -hmm. was, I was aware, you know, I, I was aware up and, and I blame that. I mean, every time I see that lavender sachet, I just think for a long time, I couldn't even look at <laughs> lavender. And then I thought, wow. Uh -huh. So at that, so, so you're saying, even though, I mean, I guess that's retraining the brain to, even though you see something mm -hmm. that you really like, oh my gosh, this is a whatever it is and you're on vacation yeah <laughs> yeah there's no time that you you turn it off it, it you can dial it up you can dial it down but i don't think you realize you it, cannot though. completely be like okay i'm on holiday that means that everybody else around me is probably on holiday too including the criminals no they're not and the thing is like just like with the pandemic that's going on violent crime has jumped 30 or 40 percent we are suffering in a pandemic crime is still having to happen because the same motivational factors that push someone to do something like that are still in play, if not perhaps worse. So it never takes any time off. You have to go into every environment with an expectation that you could be a target. And that goes for me too. That it's always funny because people are like, well, you know, you're a burly former commander who's coming yeah, after you. Exactly. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I got, I got targeted for a robbery on a train in Atlanta. I was in Grand Central Park or Central Park in New York. I was pinged by a guy there who thought it might be worthwhile grabbing my camera. You have to see them coming early enough to take your preemptive steps so that they go somewhere else. Because the sad truth is 
there's always somebody easier. So if you are alert and you can catch their eye for a moment and let them know, yes, I've seen you and I could now ID you in a lineup, that's often enough because there's going to be someone right behind you who's not paying attention, who is focused on the sachets in a window and suddenly goes, look, here's my purse. It's true. It happens. Give the, so the eye contact work? The possibility. Did the eye contact Sorry? work? I'm just wondering. Sorry to interrupt you. Did the eye contact oh, yeah, yeah. work? Absolutely. Oh, the guy in Central Park in New York, I caught him twice. Now, you know, there's an old acronym for the military, TED, time, environment, distance, demeanor. How many times have you seen the same person? How many times have you been in the same location? And, and so if you see someone more than once, unless there's a reason for you to be all moving in the same direction, that's not a coincidence. Somebody has chosen to be at that location at the same time you are. I saw this guy twice. And the second time I saw him, I could... It was like I could physically see him working out distances between us because I'm walking around Central Park taking pictures with a nice camera. And he's looking at me going, mm -hmm. yeah, he's focused. He's, he's taking pictures. He's not focused on the environment. I saw this guy 15 minutes ago. And when I saw him a second time, I'm like, no. So when I saw him kind of do a little peek out from behind a tree, maybe 20 yards away, looking at the distance between us, I oriented on him, turned towards physically towards him. When he poked his head out again, I went, Wow. And he, he literally gave me a smirk like, yeah, all right. And, and literally walked away like, no, nah, no worries. And it was, it was literally in that moment. I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, I know. And now we all know. So do you want to escalate this crime to something much more serious than just a snatch and grab? Or do you want to go find an easier target? And in, in, in this case, he went and found the easier target. And it's funny because there's a magic, this is what I call the Goldilocks period for eye contact. So when you're out and about and if you see someone you think is paying you too much attention, give them a little bit of eye contact and it needs to be around two to three seconds. You don't want it to be less. You won't remember anything, but you don't want it to be more than three, maybe four seconds, because longer than that, it becomes a challenge or could be misconstrued as interest. You don't want that either. You want to look at this individual long enough for them to know you can now ID them. You could go to a sketch artist at the police station and go, this is what they look like. That's nine times out of 10, that's enough to put that person off and have them moving on the way. Now, it's not foolproof. That person may decide, I don't care. I'm coming anyway. But at least if you can minimize, you know, make it harder for them to be successful, mm -hmm. that's often enough to put them off going through with it in the first place. So your eye contact with a stranger all the time. Two, three seconds. I'm looking, I'm acknowledging, I see you. You can do a little head nod or perhaps a lip compression, what I call a social smile. And then you're moving on. But you've given them enough eye contact for them to know, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they looked at me long enough for them to know who I am. They'll go somewhere else. Wow, that's very valuable advice because we don't even, well, this is your expertise, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I'll say, so ch share the train incident. Oh, uh, that was funny. So I was using the Marta. We lived in Buckhead in Atlanta and I was going downtown. It's just easier not to drive there. I took the Marta to go downtown and I was sitting on a train on a bench seat that faced into the carriage. I never sit with my back anywhere if I can help it. So I was sitting on the bench seat and two guys got on maybe early, early twenties, maybe late teens, but a couple of what looked to me like thugs. They had the walk, they had the attitude, they had it all. And they sat down on the bench seat opposite me and were giving me the eye. And it was funny because this, because we're going back in quite a few years now, but there were, there were a number of robberies going on in some of the larger cities where people were being mugged for their shoes, tennis shoes, boots, Timberland boots, especially were one of the things that were being targeted. One of the guys gave his buddy a nudge and did one of these numbers at my feet. And I, it dawned on me very rapidly they just decided maybe this is worthwhile because there's two of them. So even though I'm a burly chap and able to take care of myself, they have numbers. So, you know, most crimes come about because of perception on the half of the bad guy. They think they can get away with it or overpower or they have more strength or more weapons or whatever. So the two of them decided I was maybe a good candidate. So I'm sitting in the train and I'm thinking this could be interesting. Let's see how this plays out for these two. I got my knife with me. At this point, I wasn't an American citizen, so I wasn't carrying concealed, but I did have my knife and I've been teaching edge weapons for a bunch of years. So part of me, I got to admit, 
the ego driven side of me was like, let's see where this goes. I quickly put myself in check, probably a little bit like you with your daughter in that story you said earlier. I'm like, what would I tell one of my students? Would I really tell them to square up and challenge these two and see if they can do it? Because you could, you can lose on any given day, just the same as you can win. It's just a reality. I'm like, no, I wouldn't. I tell one of my students, you need to put them off even bothering at what, however you need to do it. You've got to stop it now before it escalates. And so I implemented one of my plans and I'd never had a chance to use it before. But before I tell you what I did, I would like to know what you would do in that situation, sitting on the train, two individuals who look like they've decided they're going to try and mug you for something. What would you do in response? Uh, well, being under five feet, I think I would um, try to find someone near me. To... <laughs> now that I know, but I think I would look at them. But, you know, when you're under 100 pounds and you're under five feet tall, it is it's scary. But my immediate reaction would be to look around and just find someone like I don't know if it's the, the, not the train, someone someone bigger than me, someone who I know can can save me, which is not a. I know it's probably what the the poor no, no. woman who's in distress like ah <laughs> help is, save I my asked life. This question, I asked this question of groups large and small, and everybody has a, a similar approach. Some people say, "Well, I'll get up and leave the carriage." I'm like, well, where, "Where am I going? If they follow me to the next carriage, what am I just going to keep going until I run out of carriages?" So you, but you've also relinquished space, and, and they know that you're scared, so that's not an option. But people have because they've never really thought about it, they don't really know what they do. So they start coming up with things on the spot that may or may not be successful. For instance, you looking for someone to help. Well, in litigious times, when people try their best to not get involved in other people's crap, the chances that you catch the eye of someone who feels heroic that day and wants to intervene on your behalf is next to nil. No, maybe you get lucky. You may find a couple of guys on there that are like, yeah, we got you, you know, we'll help you. But the reality is most likely they're going to avoid your eye contact. Like, later, that's your problem. I'm, right. I'm not getting involved. So that won't work. One of us, one of the other, one of the others would be, um, if I'm asking a group of people, it would be, well, engage them in conversation, get them talking. Mm. Have you ever tried to talk when you feel stressed and you're anxious and you're fearful? Oh, wow. Well. Your vocal tone constricts. So now you go, hey, fellas, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> and now you've practically begged them to mug you. You're like, listen, we're going to do this. You know what I mean? Like you might as well just give somebody, somebody said at one, one event, they're like, just hand over your boots. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm going home to my wife as this former British, you know, commando. And I just gave them up. Mm -mm. No, no, it's something not like that just sticks. So it's not going to happen. So ultimately this is what I did. So the train is rocking. And instead of rocking this way, I start rocking this way. And after a few seconds of doing this, I start looking like I'm listening to someone talking to me. And I keep escalating <laughs> I, this behavior. Speaking of that, if you act like you're crazy or you have mental <laughs> Ill issues, then they'll be like, Correct. oh, I don't want to be next to them. Mm -hmm. So I start getting into character. Now, when I say I'm in character, I mean, I'm full on. And at this point, I'm barking like a German shepherd. I'm stopping <laughs> are we, to listen to Are people to around me. you? People are around you? <laughs> I'm barking. I'm listening. I'm laughing maniacally. I'm looking right at the bigger of the two guys. And he's looking at me. And at first, you could tell he's a little bit like, yeah, right. You're crazy. But after about two or three minutes, because I had my Robert De Niro on, I was in character. I didn't let up. I'm now bobbing up and down like, yeah, we're going to do this. And I'm going, <laughs> I'm telling you, batshit crazy. So I'm doing this. I'm barking. These two go. And they're looking at each other. And they, they orient. They ventrally break away. They orient towards each other. And you can see them looking at each other going, no, whatever this guy's got going on, I don't want any part of it. And when the train pulled into the next station, because I was going this whole time, I'm like, yeah, I got, I got, I got, not with your shoes. I'm never stop. <laughs> the doors open and these two go like gray hands at the slip. They're out the door. And it's I keep hilarious. going until the doors close because I don't want them getting back in and changing their mind. The doors close. They're going by the window going, woo, like <laughs> locusts. 
at this point, the train pulls out, pulls off, and I start looking around the carriage to see, and there's one, there's an old lady sitting across on one of the side seats looking at me. She's like, she's just laughing. She's like, that was nice, like well played. So wow. a big dose of crazy, it's, it's very hard to intimidate crazy. It's, it's hard to reason with it. And if you try to open your mouth to, to intimidate and you can't hear what you say because the person you're trying to talk to is barking at you like a German shepherd, where are you going with it? And it worked. But I already had an idea in my mind that if something like this ever happened and I needed to put somebody off doing something, maybe I'd go for a big dollop of crazy. And it worked. <laughs> it's something that I've been telling for decades, but it worked because I already had a plan. I knew, okay, I'm going to do this because I'm not retreating. I'm not giving them up, up my boots and I'm not going to try and engage them in conversation. I'm not going to flash my knife at them and say, you want to try? Because what if they get off the train and tell some cop felony menacing, that guy just flashed a knife at us. Now I'm in trouble. So you've got to already know some pros and cons of what you would do and then what the consequences may be and et cetera. And the good thing about being crazy is it actually builds your confidence. I found as I got into character that I really started to get into character. I barked much more aggressively halfway through <laughs> as I did in the beginning. But you, you really find yourself like, yeah, okay, this is working, you know, and, and it was really fun with it. Watch. You know, that yeah. takes a lot of courage, though. Oh, it did. I fully committed. Pretty better that than them deciding, okay, we're going to beat this guy up and take his boots. It was, I mean, it's ridiculous. Right. Yeah. I, I've heard silly things being stolen for, mm -hmm. and then they get beat up just for their. Yeah. Just for sport. Yeah. Yeah. So that, those are two instances. So I suppose my point to all this is we are all vulnerable to a point and the possibility exists for each of us at different points in different situations. Accepting that doesn't make us weak. It just should serve as a catalyst to know we need to be attentive we have to be attentive on behalf of ourselves and our kids. And so doing that and being supremely anchored in the moment at different points throughout the day means you, you take yourself out of the victim pool by looking like and behaving like a harder target. I love that because I, I remember a few years ago, um, more than 10 years ago, I decided when I'm 56 now, so maybe like in my 40s, my friends wanted to go night clubbing in our 40s so we go to the club and we are people from like i don't know 21 through 60 something and they're both of them are paranoid someone's gonna put something in our drink someone might like i don't know do something really really like scary but mm -hmm. it's amazing how just people watching right and yeah. being aware of what might happen and so we're you know women in the nightclub we want to take pictures so i I don't know what I was thinking. I asked someone to take a picture of us. Oh no, someone, some guy came up to us. Some guy came to us and says, oh, can I take a picture of you three ladies in red? And then um, we, then I asked him if, I, if he can send me the picture. His girlfriend's there and he goes, oh, put, my, put your phone number in my phone. And Terry, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't thinking. Because my friend said, oh, yeah. And she's the one who was paranoid. Oh, yeah, she can send us the picture. None of them gave their number. And I was like, OK, we want this picture. So I, so I put my number in his phone. And his girlfriend just shoots daggers at me. And I'm thinking, geez, it's just a, we just want the group picture. Aww. So the next day, Terry, I'm at Costco. My phone, I get a text from the guy. Ooh. And I go, Thomas, and he goes, hey, um, pretty lady in red, um, you know, I'm the one who you met last night. And I was like, oh, Thomas. And he goes, just ignore it. Or you want me to respond? I'm like, no, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna like ignore it. And I thought, what was I thinking? So I immediately tell my, my friends and they're like, oh yeah, we should have <laughs> <laughs> yeah, given no. your number. And then I felt so stupid because I thought what was I thinking but you're in the moment yeah and that could have been that could have gone bad because now with the bad. phone number you could locate right mm. yeah I don't I don't know if you can track you but let's face it once they, they've got but the then they can number, just keep calling or they can keep, keep texting uh-huh you don't you want know. to change your phone number you know that's the phone number that yep. my clients call but I thought yep. um 
Yeah, what, what you're making me realize is, wow, we as parents too, because if you have, mm -hmm. I interviewed someone with like six kids. Can you imagine when all six kids are with you at the mall or you've seen them, right? There are three mm -hmm. car seats. The mom is just like exasperated. She's pushing the cart. She has one little one here and you are just focused on not losing your kids. Yeah. You're not no, focusing not on um, being attacked or having your purse taken. No, no, that's, that's the thing. When we're taking out young ones and now this is, you know, years behind me, but when we take them out, it was so stressful for me trying to keep track of, you know, all three kids and us and our environment. I was invariably when we were out shopping constantly in a bad mood because there was so <laughs> much of a drain on my resources, trying to track everything. It was exhausting. But the reality is you only need to misplace one child once, even for a short period of time for you to realize how debilitatingly scary it is to have that happen. And on the one occasion that I could, I will admit to not being really attuned to what was going on with my family. We had family in town and we all went to the mall and my family came from you know England. So going to a mall was a big deal and everybody was talking and there were lots of us and we haven't seen each other in donkey's ages. So it was one of those rare culmination of circumstances where we all felt like everybody was watching the kids. But unfortunately, between the conversations, the shops moving, it turned out none of us were. And we mis, uh, misplaced, lost our oldest daughter at that point. She was about six. And it was one of those instances where she had seen something in a store window that was shiny. And six-year-olds and shiny things, they're gone, like in a, in a second. Well, she did the run to the store just as we turned a corner. And even though it was only a minute or so that we were not literally counting heads, because, you know, you're constantly going around with, okay, one, two, three, those are the number I came with, those are the three I want to leave with. We all stood and stopped and said, where's Cora? And it was heart-stoppingly, throw up in your mouth scary. It took us 25 minutes to find her, because when she realized she wasn't with us, she backtracked. She got turned around herself, went back the way she came because that seemed familiar. But literally two days before this instance, before we had the, we lost one of our children, we had told her, if you ever get lost in a mall, you need to look for another mother with other children and tell her you're lost. Don't go looking for security. If you see a law enforcement officer with all the equipment and police and a gun, that's, that's going to be okay. But your first priority is to find a mother with kids. Find her, tell her you're lost. She'll know what to do. And that's exactly what Cora did. Wow. During this 25 minutes of literally, I was so angry at myself for having not been attentive that one time. I've, I still haven't forgiven myself. That was, that was awful, especially for a guy whose entire life is built around safety one minute, one distraction. And when we did finally find her, she had found two mothers with I think five or six kids between them. And they had gone straight into a store, contacted the manager, and then they put a call over the tannoy in the mall to say, young girl, Cora has been found, come to. I can't tell you that one lesson with having her look for another mother with kids and not just any old stranger or going to a security guard who I don't trust, by the way. So that one lesson was worth its weight in gold. And we had, we'd had that conversation with her two days before going to the mall. So everything that I preach is based on some personal experience or because I know how it feels to just have that one moment. And a parent with multiple kids going out, leaving the house at all, you are already drained of resources, just trying to keep tabs on everybody. So adding another thing of look at your environment, it's a big ask and I know it is, but unfortunately it's a necessary component every time you go out. As we've just seen with the shooting that happened at a grocery store, whenever there's another attack, whenever something like this happens, it brings home how important it is 
to be supremely anchored in the moment, attentive to your primary, which is keeping your, all your kids together, but then also what's going on around you. I did a video recently talking about teams of people looking for kidnapped victims. And this is where they have sent someone into a department store or a grocery store or at the mall, and they're taking pictures of potential victims, people that they think that would be a good candidate or this person would be a good candidate or that kid would be a good candidate. And they're texting those images to people outside. So that the person you saw in the store and maybe creeped you out isn't the one that's going to snatch you in the parking lot or grab your kid in the parking lot. It's somebody else. So you have to be aware that if somebody is within the periphery of your environment, perhaps paying too much attention to you and your kids, that person may disappear. They wander off after they've done the pictures or whatever they've done, but they've sent it to the team outside now waiting. Now, is this an unusual circumstance? Of course, but at the same time, not so unusual that it shouldn't be at least considered as a possibility. So that when you leave the department store, the grocery store, or wherever it is, having had that weird thing happen, don't think that that's the end of it. Think perhaps maybe that's the beginning. And now as you head outside, if you've got any kind of a sense that something's not right, go back in and call the police and say something weird just happened. Could you send an officer just to escort me to my car? If they are not already slammed, they will be happy to have someone come to you, you can tell them exactly what happened and they'll walk you to your vehicle, do whatever it takes to not end up in a position where suddenly, you know, one of your kids or, or you are grabbed because you discounted that that one person's gone and instead that was just the beginning of something bad. And that's quite a extreme example, but it's definitely one where I've heard someone talk about, I saw someone taking pictures of my kids in a Target. And when I got outside, I realized that there were a couple of vans parked in different places with people in them. She said, I turned right back around and went inside. She's like, something about this whole thing didn't feel right. I called the police. And when the cops got there, they said, we've had a couple of these recently. And although you spotted it, the others said that they were followed to their car. It wasn't, you know, until they pulled out their phone to dial 911 or one girl ended up pulling the mace and stuff out that they realized what was happening. So it's having this, first of all, being in tune with your instincts, but knowing that although you're pulled in multiple directions, especially if you have many kids, and I know it's exhausting, add one more thing of knowing bad guys operate in all kinds of environments. And when you're at your most distracted is when they have the best chance of success. So your ability to predict possibly that something bad may be going on could be critical in keeping you and your clan safe. Wow, that is very eye-opening because yeah. I think, um, well, yeah, and I think, I don't know if it's just moms who have like a billion things, you, like you said, in our head and we are not aware of this is simple things. I love how you said to teach your kids. See, I told my daughter to go to a, a, a worker. We were at, uh, she was maybe six. She will never forgive me for it. We were in the, looking at for a computer and I don't know what happened. I guess I, I walked away and she didn't know I walked away. And I was yeah. probably just on to the next computer, but me was around the corner. Mm -hmm. And then we hear, um, we just found, you know, a five-year-old Sabrina Gibson. And I was like, wait a minute. She was right next to me. But she had gone to a, a worker who had made the announcement, but I didn't even realize how you said be cautious of security guards or people who you think might help you. Yes. But the moms, going to moms, brilliant, because, yeah. I mean, I would say 99% of the moms, they, their heart will, you know, they, will, and I've done it mm -hmm. where you see a lost kid. Yes, and, all you need and to your see, heart breaks. Gosh, you go straight to that kid without even yep. being asked. To. Don't even think about it. Yep. Yeah. When we talked to the mother that was with Cora and her friend, they said the moment we saw her face, she looked so scared. It, they literally were like ready to lay down their life to keep this one safe. And they had all theirs, you know, go run around as well. And they were like, pull the pull the brood to me. And they had an immediate instinctive response to help. Look, I, I don't want to bad math security guards. There are a lot of good security guards in the world. But mm -hmm. there are also a lot that tried to become police officers that can't, didn't pass the mm -hmm. test, background test, or whatever else it may have been. They end up as security guards. I wouldn't say there's always a correlation, but there's 
definitely something where they wanted that power, they wanted to be in that position of authority, and they were denied. And so getting a little bit of that power, it, it, it can go to their head sometimes. So we have them steer clear. Now, if it's a police officer, we told them, you see the gun, you see the badge, you see police, you can talk to them. Because the, the chances that that one person is the bad apple is pretty bloody slim. But out of all the choices, going to another mother with kids, and that was the caveat, and that's what Cora remembered. She said, I knew I needed to find a, a woman with kids. She's like, so that's what she did. And she was, I mean, she calmed down within seconds of being found. She's like, oh, good, you're here. You know, kind of very relaxed, immediately over it. I was pulling my hair out. I, in fact, I wasn't gray until this yeah. happened. And yeah, it went gray. it's the most scariest, it's, scariest feeling. Instantly, yes. I was so angry at myself. It took me months to really calm down again because it's one, one second. So having a plan and your kids know what the plan is and they know what their role is in it can be taught at a very early age and they do remember. Mm -hmm. They will remember. So, you know, it's something very worthwhile having that conversation with them. Wow. Thanks for the reminder. This has been very, very enlightening. I think, you know, my whole, a lot of my conversations are how to parent, how to, you know, do deal with the grades. But this conversation, I think is so beneficial, especially in what we're going through. I mean, awareness, big time, right? Just being aware, having a plan, teaching them at a young age. And as a parent, I guess now I know not to um, focus on my to-do list. <laughs> Yeah, I will give myself permission. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when you're in the grocery store too, sometimes you're like, oh, wait a minute, I need mm -hmm. this. Oh, I forgot to put this on my list. And then your yeah. whole focus is just your recipe. And yep. you're not even thinking of, I would never even think of someone in my own local grocery store, mm -hmm. the Target. I don't know. That is the, the last thing that I would, that yeah. I would think of. But, you know, and especially, well, I shouldn't say just, in Hawaii, but no matter, I guess, what you know what you just said when you're comfortable in your location? Correct. So um, recently, my daughter's a, a part-time cashier at a local grocery store. And she mm -hmm. said, what do you think of this? They had teenagers from her school uh, steal liquor. The camera was on them. And one of the workers says, hey, look, they're stealing liquor and putting them in their backpack. Just making an observation, not doing anything. And then someone says, well, should we call the manager? Okay, this is going on. This is going on. Mm -hmm. Manager comes and says, you know what? I know you stole that. And it's like, I didn't steal anything. Open your backpack. The manager runs after them. The kid, I'm sure under 18, punches the manager. Yep. Kicks off. And she, you know, my daughter's just doing a little cashier thing. Very calm. Oh, yeah, there was some, the way she told the story. Yeah, there's some kids from my high school and they, and the, and the lady was asked to file a report and the police officer says, I know it's scary, but you're gonna have to go to court. You're gonna have to do this. And she says, I I'm, I'm not sure if I'm gonna do that. And I thought yeah. those kids are gonna get away with it. But what yeah. is your, um, in closing your suggestion, if, if you do see a crime in progress, you are fearful because you don't want the attention to go on you. And as uh, under someone under five feet, I don't know if I would say like, stop, because I mean, I don't know if they have a weapon. I mean, I don't want to, you know, do that. But the manager, then you look at this manager, and I think she said he must have been in his 40s, um, mild mannered. And I'm sure he didn't think he was going to get punched. Well, that's the thing. The, you have to look at, okay, what are the circumstances? Am I saving lives here? Or is it relatively in the scheme of crimes? Is it relatively low? And it is relatively low. Is it worthwhile being on the receiving end of a, of a punch? Or perhaps they break one of those liquor bottles and yeah, stick it in. That's what I thought of. Just, it's not worth it. There are professionals trained to deal with it. Call them. You know, okay, if you're the employee, go to a manager, but call the professionals. They have training to deal with exactly this. You don't need to be the one to try and intervene. In fact, really, staying safe is about <laughs> keeping that's clear your goal right that's your goal yes okay because if it they could run go off. wrong in a heartbeat even if you 
have all these skills, a lucky punch isn't going to make any difference to you if you're laying unconscious on the ground versus a highly trained punch. They still both hurt and they both have the potential to knock you unconscious. So pick when you would, if necessary, get involved. If you were coming to the aid of some poor kid getting beaten up, yeah, that may be one of the times to, you know, sack up and get in there and, and try and stop it, maybe. But even then, if you have people you can call to come and deal, great. But you have to make that choice, I think, on a case by case for yourself. And if there's a way to avoid it, it's not that you are running away. It's self-preservation and the legalities of getting involved can be incredibly complex, not to mention the chances of injury exponentially grow when someone is cornered and unable to escape. So it's one of those. No, I would not recommend jumping in the middle to stop a shoplifter. Call it in. They got him on camera. Food, right? I mean, if that kid, um, if that manager punched the kid or restrained him and the kid gets hurt, but I'm sure he felt bad that he let the bad boys, you know, get away. But like you said, mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize it is the perspective on how severe was this crime. I think it was two, yeah. couple, um, right? Mm -hmm. A couple of bottles of it liquor. Is. And, uh, you know, anyone, male or female, from one moment to the next can say enough already. I'm not taking this crap anymore. And they do something, you know, okay. But you've made a choice in, on how you do it. And the best thing to do is to try as much as possible, leave, leave your ego to the side if possible, think through, okay, is this really worth it? And that's much easier said than done in the moment when you're mad because someone is taking something from your store or whatever the circumstances may be. But at some point you have to go, okay, self-preservation for me and mine, that's top. Everything else is secondary. And if you prioritize safety above all else, you'll think twice about doing quite a few things. And that's not bad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. I'm so glad I signed up for that Kajabi. Both of us have it on hold. Um, it was an online yeah. course thing, but I, but follow, how can people get in touch with you? Because I love your videos. People have to have to, you guys have to follow Terry. Some of his videos are so funny because he does encounter challenges with that British accent. We love to hear it, but if you <laughs> in order at a fast food restaurant, it becomes a whole different experience, doesn't it? All right, I tell you what, let me, can I share my screen with you for a moment? I have to, I think I have Cheers. to put um, multiple participants can share simultaneously, right? Yeah, you just have to make me a host for a moment. I, I did multiple participants can, would... yeah, I, I said that you can, um, we, participants can share. So let's right, see. Awesome. Let, me, let me pull this up for a moment. There's my website and email if they have any questions, because sometimes I... <laughs> I go off on a tangent when I get excited and who knows if I explained anything clearly. So if somebody wants to ask me questions and then if you're interested in connecting with me on any of these social media platforms, please do. I have a- Oh, you have a TikTok. I have to follow TikTok. your TikTok. Oh my gosh, I didn't know you had that. I saw Instagram. I have to look at, um, I think I came across the YouTube, but oh yeah, you your TikToks must be pretty entertaining and educational though, yeah. right? Some are education. I try, I keep it light. I kind of alternate. Like I've just done one recently that was like a gun disarm. <laughs> there are a million ways to take a gun away from someone. There's a million ways they might point a gun at you. That was just one technique I thought I would post. And I think it ended up with about 160,000 views. So I was, I didn't, oh. expect, I didn't <laughs> expect that. So I'm going to have to probably do a few more of those. But yes, on TikTok, I think I have about 120,000 followers. And Instagram, I'm still trying to grow. But yeah, please connect with me there. Make sure you message and tell me where you have you found me from. And I've got some YouTube videos I've just started doing on body language analysis since the pandemic is not going away fast enough. So I've got a little bit of analysis on there as well if you're interested in human behavior or body language. So please connect. When I think that um, parents can really benefit from just learning about body language because yes, don't our kids show us Oh, yeah, yeah. My, my kids, well, when they were younger, there would be signals that they would give off. Now they know enough about what I do to not even bother trying. We just exactly. have conversations. <laughs> and that's but what we have to get to. if you want to have me back, if you want yes, to have me definitely. back, definitely do one, 
on the body language of kids. It's just today where I prepped for personal safety and we can always do one on. I'm so glad we did this. I, yes, this is so beneficial. And I would love to have you back to just talk about how parents can not give in to and not, I mean, I could, you know, react and then all hell breaks loose if you don't know how to read the body language or you react. Don't yes. you think reacting can cause chaos? I mean, big time. It's true. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sherry. You have a great day. And um, I'm going to follow your TikTok right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye.